uh, every so often we have a, have a testimony and Sophie would like to come up and just share something uh, today before we have the message. Give her a welcome. Come on up. Hey, Chet. Well, firstly, ignore the sultanas. I will get them. I'm sorry for Phoenix. <laughs> Um, I just really wanted to share something with you from the past week. Um, it's been a really like big week. Uh, you, as a Christian, you always think that when you're confronted with the promised land, you're going to behave like Joshua and be like, woo! Um, and I fell into the trap of being an Israelite. And I looked in the promised land and went, hmm. Uh, as you guys know, I've had a long journey with chronic pain and endometriosis, and it's been you know, a big thing. And I recently got into a pain program at the Stars Hospital uh, that's really focused on, you know, just managing your pain, learning more about it and living life despite it, getting some of your life back. And my surgery also came through and I thought, wow, this is God's timing. You know, they're going to cut everything out and, you know, I'm going to get some semblance of a life back. It didn't even occur to me to start praying for a miracle or anything like that. You know, we've We've gone through this roundabout that many times. I just, that was where my focus was at. And, you know, without knowing, on the other side of the world, my mum's church in England were all fasting and praying for the surgery. Uh, I went in, and when I came around, uh, they couldn't find a single trace of the endometriosis. Like, not even past scars. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that would have been my reaction, except I burst into tears and I was an Israelite and I was like oh god but hang on a minute does that mean the pain is gone like I'm looking into this promised land and I'm going oh my goodness there's giants like it, is the pain connected to the endometriosis what if what if what if what if what if what if and I fully miss the fact God just did an epic miracle like this disease doesn't have a cure there is scar tissue we cut it out last time and they couldn't see it this time so yes miracle um but luckily for me, unlike the Israelites, uh, we have grace. <laughs> and I can go back to that moment and be like, oh, can we try that again? Um, so uh, where I'm at now, and I just wanted to share it, was that I am this promised land. Uh, and I'm saying, thank you, God, that endometriosis is gone. It's not in my body. Um, and I'm stepping in, come what may, whatever giants, maybe the pain is a separate battle. But that's, God's got that. Like, he's, he's already done that, so we just got to walk it. And uh, if you guys catch me behaving like an Israelite, f feel free to, you know, smack me upside the head with some biblical truth. <laughs> um, not your hands. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to share that so you can join me in just praising God for the, the miracle that, that did happen and that this healing journey is just continuing through. So, yeah, thank you. Just stay for now. So, Father... Let's stretch forth your hand. Let's, Lord, you've begun the miracle. You've done something already, but we're ex asking for more. And let, as uh, the words have come out of Sophie's mouth, the healing will continue. And we speak that over her life now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sophie. Well, isn't that good, eh? Wonderful. Wow. More to come. Build your faith. Let your expectancy continue to rise. Okay, more to come. The church has the hope of the world. The world doesn't have the answers. It patches things up. The world doesn't have the answers. But Jesus is the answer. And, uh, yeah, let's, let's continue to remember that. You know, the church is here for a purpose. You're here for a purpose. And uh, uh, a number of years ago, the, um, there was a, a book or a study book called The Purpose Driven Church. It was embraced by many denominations. And, uh, and, and, and what it was, I think one, one of the reasons why it caught on was it, it got the church to refocus. What are we here for? What are we here for? 
And uh, I've called this today Purpose Driven because there's a purpose behind the things that we do as a church. There's a purpose behind the way you live your life. There is purpose. And, uh, and so we need to get that, that kind of thing deep inside us. You remember last week when we, we saw how the Holy Spirit was poured out into the church. The church became empowered. You remember there was, there was a, a sound from heaven that sounded like wind. You remember that? It, it came and it flooded inside the very uh, building that they were in. It wasn't wind coming from outside. It was something inside. You remember the fire that came and rested on the heads. And you remember that as the result of that, that the, the, the people, the 120, they were getting so excited that uh, they attracted a crowd. And that crowd came together and the crowd heard them testifying, heard them declaring the wondrous works of God. And they heard them declaring it, not just in um, whatever the language was they were speaking, it probably could have been Greek or whatever, Aramaic, but they were speaking it in all the different other dialects from around the world. And it mentions all that there. They were hearing it. And there was this, that great witness and that set the scene. That set the scene for what was to come. So what was the first church, what did it look like? Did it have a whole lot of robes and cathedrals and structures? See, we've got to stop and think about that. Where did all that come from? I've had the privilege of planting four churches. And each church, this next section of scripture... Is what I shared of what the church is. Let's have a look at it. Acts 2, 43 to 47. And uh, in my uh, <coughs> the translation I'm reading from, it says this. Every believer was faithfully devoted to the following, to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another. Sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. And a deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone. And the apostles uh, performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers were in fellowship as one body. And they shared with one another whatever they had. And out of generosity, they even sold their assets to distribute the proceeds uh, to those who were in need among them. And daily they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. They were continually filled with praise to God enjoying the favour of all the people and the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to life. In that that translation says coming to life. Some of your translations have the word saved. But that's what you get saved, you're actually coming to life. You see what I mean? So that that meaning is, is there already. That was the snapshot of the early church. Just, just the way they, they, they functioned at that time. Of course, it always starts with something. It starts with a question. And the early church started with a question. The question was, what shall we do? You see, when, when the people heard them speaking in various languages, declaring the wonders of God... Peter ended up getting up and he, and he preached this sermon, you might remember. And he preached and told the people what was going on. And when the people heard what, 
what was happening, they said, well, what shall we do? You see, the start of a church, the start of you being part of a church is, what shall we do? And this is what Peter said to them. He says, repent and return to God and each one of you must be baptised in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, to have your sins removed or forgiven and then you can take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. For God promised the Holy Spirit is for you and for your families and for those yet to be born and for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's what he said. And as a response to that, 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ. See, there's this word repent. That word repent, it's not a common word in our vocabulary. But what it simply means is change your mind and the direction of your life. We've got to understand, church, that people could have religious overtones. They can say they're going to do this. They may even turn up at church. But guys, we've got to communicate to people, unless there is repentance, unless there is a change of thinking, followed by a change of direction, that is not being born again. And we're going to unpack this as we go. It says they are to be baptised. This is talking about being baptised in water. And you will see coming up on the screen, this is a, a picture not far from where Peter was actually speaking at the time. And these are the kind of, uh, what they were called, they're called the, the milkfa. They're um, immersion pools that the Jewish people had. They had many of them around the place. And that's why when those early Christians, when they first gave their lives to the Lord, they already had a concept of what it was to be baptised. That concept was already there. That's why they could be baptised virtually straight away. They just had to have a little bit of tweaking of what was going on. And then he says, you receive forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. That's, that's a simple thing. Repent, okay? Turn to the Lord, okay? Receive forgiveness, receive the Holy Spirit. It's a very simple thing. And sometimes we complicate it all too much. Let it be part of us. And, and if you've been on a journey and your journey has been fairly long with the Lord and you're starting to miss some of the simplicity but some of the, the magnitude of what it is to be a believer, then stir yourself up. Today's the day to change. Don't stay in bureaucracy. Just don't let apathy get a hold of us. So this it gets summed up in these ways. It's a culture that we say in the church. But firstly, it's talking about love for God. Notice what they did. It says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and everyone was filled with awe. That's a good part to start, isn't it? These, in fact, are signs of when you're really born again. If you claim to be born again and uh, you, you've lost your devotion, then understand that that's something that you've lost. It's not the way that you need to be. You can be filled with the Spirit to such an extent that you are devoted. That word devoted means to give exclusively to. And it says here, they, give, they gave themselves exclusively to teaching. In other words... <coughs> They were wanting to find out about this Jesus more and more and more. They wanted to find out, ah, now I'm a Christian. How do I live as a Christian? Not this playing around. No, how do I live as a Christian? 
They devoted themselves to that. And so they pressed in, they pressed in. The word of God says they had this, this, this fellowship. Now again, fellowship doesn't get used so much in our vocabulary. A partner, perhaps, gives something of the meaning. We become partners in this whole thing. Uh, one of the translations actually puts it this way, that their hearts were mutually linked to one another. That we become linked to one another. There's, there's, a, there's a sense where the church can move forward together. We've heard this morning already about us being a body connected in. And that's what the early church was like. They began to, to do that. They, they were passionate for the word of God and, and seeking to find out those gems. Look, you can walk with the Lord for 40 and 50 years, but if you're passionate for the word of God, he'll reveal more of himself to you as you press in. He does it again and again and again. And that fellowship, something that, you know, the world is craving for. The world is craving for connection. And somehow we have to begin to mirror that. And so I'm not saying we're there. I'm saying this is, this is the simplicity of what it is to be the church. Now, if we see that, how are we going to achieve it? What do we do that helps in that developing? in getting us connected more and more together. And then there says here that he, there was the breaking of bread. That was a meal sharing. There's meal sharing and then there was communion added to that as well. We know that it was more than just sharing a meal because some of the words that are used, like for instance, the Aramaic has the word Eucharist coming out of it. We know that there was a spiritual connection in that mix as well. And notice, as you shared and heard uh, Pastor Betty mention communion this morning, there's a spiritual element that happens when we take communion. There's something spiritual that goes on. It is reminding ourselves and remembering and giving thanks that God does something in our midst. And then, of course, it talks about prayer. And there's the prayer of praise to God. And there's the prayer of intercession for people. You, you, you're picturing that, church. You're picturing that kind of going on and going on. Where we, we gather and we're praising God, but we're praying and interceding for people. Building that, building that, letting that begin to happen. And in the midst of that, it says, and they were filled with awe. They were filled with awe. You know, awe comes when you hear a testimony of something that was there and now gone. Shouldn't that bring a bit of awe into your heart that God can reach down and change something like that? You see, don't, don't lose sight of those things. Awe. And then sometimes he, the Lord can show up and it's almost like his presence is almost heavy. Would you like to sense that? See, are you hungry for it? This is the thing. See, are, you, are, you, are we, am I hungry for that? Would, would, would I, how would I stand in the presence of God become so strong? Or would I say, well, that's too scary. I don't want to go near that. See what I mean? Um, it was just the early church. It's just what it was like. It didn't have to have all the other apparatus but the presence of God and then I notice that if you break it down there was this love for people love for people 
in a, a number of different ways. Because what it, what it talks about is it talks about that there are signs and wonders and miracles. You know, if, if, you, if you have a miracle, if you have a healing, if you have a, something wonder, a wonder, who knows what a wonder is, you know? What, what is a wonder? It, it's something extraordinary anyway, isn't it? And, and you sense that and you, and you see that. And each time we see those kind of things, they're like a sign. And they're a sign that's pointing us to Jesus. First of all, to confirm who he is, because when we pray, we don't pray in the name of Buddha. We don't pray in the name of Centrelink. Or your favourite politician. We pray in the name of Jesus. Because he, he, he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the healer. And while we pray for each other and we do that, we recognise we are only the channel. The Holy Spirit on us and in us, working through us, touches somebody. All you are and all I am is the channel. And he anoints us to do these kind of things. So we pray in the name of Jesus. And every wonder and every healing and every answer to prayer and every miracle that we see demonstrates Jesus' power, that he is still alive and well. You see, he didn't go to the grave. He ascended into heaven and he's poured out his Holy Spirit into the world, into the church. It's God reaching out to a hurting world. You know, they, um, if you go to Acts 3, you see a, a demonstration of that. In Acts 3, you know, that's the uh, time there's a, there's a crippled man. He gets brought every day, placed at a certain spot, and... Uh, outside the temple and every day he's put there and he's begging no Centrelink at all see so he's begging for food he's begging for money something to keep him alive people bring him there every day you remember when the, with the, with the word of God talks about the early church they met in the temple so they hadn't been cast out of the temple yet so they could meet in the temple courts and they were meeting there every day. Now set the scene, that means that Peter and John and any other number of the disciples would have gone past this guy into the temple courts to pray. Now how many days did that go on? See, how, how many days did it go on? They would have gone a few days. Maybe a week. I don't know what length of time there is in this, in this account in scriptures. But the point is that that uh, crippled man was there and the, and the people of God were going back and forth and back and forth. But there's no one, there was no prompting to pray for that person then. But then we find a change. We find something happened. Because you see, this was a day for that crippled man to see his miracle. There's timing that comes into this. Sometimes we read the scriptures and we see all the miracles that happen. There are times when Jesus says, when there's a, a season going on, there was miracle after miracle after miracle. And we kind of lump them all together. But the reality is that sometimes there was a season where miracles broke out and then there was a time when Jesus would have walked past any number of people who were sick and they weren't healed. Timing comes into this. God seeking to demonstrate. You see, when we get to heaven, there'll be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain. All that's gone away. But right now, we're in a different era okay and every time he seeks to break through to get you and my attention it's a special thing because it's pointing to Jesus and his power and what he can do in our lives 
And so Peter and John, if you can imagine, they're walking past that, uh, that, that crippled man. And on this occasion, it says in the Word of God, and the Word is going to come up here in a minute, and it says this, that uh, Peter looked at, uh, looked straight at him. So there's the crippled man. And they come along, and, and as if on this occasion they didn't walk past him. On, on this occasion, something got their attention. Almost like they saw this crippled man for the first time. And they, they looked at him. That's what the Word of God says. It says up there. See? They looked at him. And then... The word of God tells Peter says to the crippled man, look at us. You see, God was speaking to them. You get those sign of things at times. You know, you're just going along with life. You're just doing your own thing. And then there's something that gets propped into you. This person gets your attention. Why did this person get his attention? Because God had a message for him. See, sometimes God gives you a message for someone and any time, many times, you've seen this person, you've not had the message then, you've not had any compulsion to pray then, but now there's something there. That's what Peter had. And so after he says, look at us, and the guy looks at them and he gets their attention, he's still thinking, okay, they're going to get some money out of him. And Peter says, silver and gold I don't have. But in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. He actually says in the mix of it, but what I have I'll give to you. It's a key thing. What I have, I give to you. What do you have? If you're filled with the Holy Spirit and the Lord prompts you, you don't have to worry about what's, what's going on. You just do it because something has been given to you that that person needs. Jesus said in another place, as you've been, you've been freely given, so freely give. What you've been given... Freely give. Let that be part of our lives. This is, this is what the early church has sought to practice. In many ways, it's just simple. I've received the Holy Spirit. Someone gives me an opportunity. I'll talk about the Holy Spirit. I'll pray for them. I'll pray that people get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've seen it happen years, for years. It happening. It happening again. And again, and again, you pray for some people. Now, I don't claim to be a healer. I've prayed for some people and they've got healed, and I've prayed for some people and they haven't. Perhaps you've done the same thing. But you know what? You see, because it's not me and it's not you, it's the Lord working through us. When was the right timing for that? You know, was it the right timing? We don't know all those answers. we just got to be faithful what the Lord calls us to do. And if you get the prompting to do something like that, then do it. And remember, he's, he's the one that's in control. It's his power. It's not you. You're just the channel. And so the, these kind of things, in some ways, is startling, but it's so simple. That's the way the church operates, the way the early church operated. Okay, the other thing I notice amongst these people is that it talks about them being generous. You know, it said they had everything common, and as soon as someone had a need, they gave to it. That kind of generosity as part of good Christian living. Generosity. Being generous when we see uh, people in need. Because, you know, that is the hallmark of a generous God. 
God, Jesus could have stayed in glory. He didn't have to come and, and die for us. He didn't have to come and, and take on human flesh. He didn't have to. But he did. He's a generous God. Look at the creation around us. And we see how generous he is that he's created these things that we can enjoy. A generous God. The other thing I notice is this. Amongst the people, there's a love for life. It says there, every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised God and they enjoyed the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Out of that, 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 those couple of verses, do you see... Are you catching what was going on there? Think about it. Look, first of all, they met together. They loved the church. They can't wait to get together. That's, that's one of the things. You, you, you've got to understand there was 3,000 people converted and there's probably more by the time this was written. 3,000 people were meeting together on a regular basis. Does that mean they all come together every night of the week? Probably not. It's talking about a general term. It's talking about that there was connections amongst the 3,000 plus people that was happening on a regular basis because they needed fellowship together. You see, we need each other. We really do need each other. You know, just the fact of turning up at, at, at a prayer meeting, at a connect meeting, at, at church, those kind of things. Just the part of turning up speaks volumes. And, and in the pressure that we have of, uh, uh, through COVID and the isolations that come and that sort of thing, we as the church have to find ways to, to keep building that connection with each other. Now, some of you might have, have to do that online. It doesn't work for me. I've got to push in. But for some people, it may work. But are you connecting? We've got to address these kind of things. How do we do this as we move forward in, the, in this age? You can't do away without meeting face-to-face, -face, but we've got to find some other supplements to, as well. A love for life. They loved connection. And so they had social. They socialised. This talks about them breaking bread in their homes. There's that kind of aspect of well. And they ate together. And you'll notice that the parties that they were having were pretty boisterous. It talks about them being glad. What are you glad about? You know? Some of you are the life of the party. Some of you are quieter, but, the, but you can be glad about things, positive about things. In a negative world, let's turn the positive on. And, and, and the, the, the Holy Spirit will help you in doing that. Working with your personality doesn't turn you into an extrovert if you're an introvert. It just works on where you're at. You can still show gladness. And joy in the Lord. Joy of the Holy Spirit. All of those things. It says here, they had sincerity about it. It says here that they praise God. Praise and celebration was part of it. And in the midst of it, they enjoyed the favour with outsiders. You see, sometimes the church gets a negative event because some people will get on so negative and try to ram um, law down the, down the throats of people who are not yet Christians. 
I shouldn't do it if they aren't Christians as well, but you know what I mean. Um, it doesn't work. We, we've forgotten, if we try doing that, we've forgotten something. We've forgotten that we pray for people and that the Holy Spirit is doing the work behind the scenes and it's the Holy Spirit that will end up bringing that conviction. You just share something of your life and the hope that you have and you pray on it and see what comes out of it. Well, they enjoyed the favour with people. I trust we develop as a church so that they may not agree with what we stand for, but they'll recognise there's something good about them. As people come into that pantry, they're seeing that sort of thing again and again now. They may not want to come to church, but they're seeing something. And we're getting comments. We're getting comments of people saying, ah, oh, that's what the church would, should be like. One person just bails in here. We're having a meeting up there. Nothing else is on. He's looking for something. And that's one of the comments that he makes. He doesn't go to a church anywhere. I don't know if he's, a, he's been a past believer or what. But, but the comment that he made... Oh, it's good to see the church doing something. You know, is that kind of thing as if the church hasn't been doing something? Good to see the church doing something. Let's get that multiplied, eh? Let's, let's see that begin to happen more and more and more. So that favour comes out there because there's a whole lot of negative stuff. The devil will highlight all the negative stuff and that people will get sucked in. So... The Holy Spirit, though, through you and me, needs to demonstrate the good stuff. I read a report today, just over breakfast, that uh, the healthiest people in the world are those who are religious. They've done, done some sort of report, and if you're so-called religious, you're expected to live seven years more than someone who's not religious. How about that? Well, as long as I get promoted sometime, <laughs> I will wait for the promotion. <coughs> yes, so, um, <coughs> yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of things that we can seek to put out there. But the thing is this, the Lord added to the church those who are being saved. Church, through your prayers, there are people being ministered to all around. Because your prayers, when you pray and intercede for your community and for those around you, you're coming into agreement with God's heart, who doesn't want anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And as you come in agreement with that, the Holy Spirit is working behind the scenes. The Holy Spirit seeks to give everybody an opportunity of coming to him, of coming to know the Lord. So you keep doing that. But remember, when God gives you the opportunity to share the hope that was in you, because he's already laid the foundation, he's already doing something. Someone's already heard something on the radio or they've seen something on TV or they've read something or they've seen something on social media that's got them thinking. You may be the next step of that process but the Holy Spirit is just taking that and he'll use you and he'll use me to bring these people in and you'll begin to see people being added again. That's what we need to be praying for. So right now, what I'd like us to do is represent the body. I want you to gather. If you can gather, like there's a group over here, maybe these, you guys, if you could gather here, I want you to begin to pray for each other and pray for the release uh, of, of the Holy Spirit. You got a, a, this is the bigger group here, maybe you could split in two. Just, just swing the chairs around and begin to pray for each other. Begin to pray for this community. Begin to lift this community up that they'll begin to see the goodness of God in this place. The goodness of God in Burp and Gary. Just swing around. 
begin to pray. There may be just one or two that can, that, that can begin to, to lead off in your group. Just feel free to do so. Begin to pray. Father, as these, these people gather together, I'm just praying a release in the name of Jesus over their lives. Holy Spirit, will you impact them? Will you stir them up by your Spirit? Cause them even now to begin to pray specific things, Father, over the people next to them and over this community and over this church in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Change our hearts as we stand. 